This morning I want to preface my homily with a asterisk, I guess I want to say. This weekend I'll be using examples from my family, and the reason I want to preface this is because I'm not, I'm not judging my family, I'm not being critical of the way that I was raised, I'm not blaming them for anything of who I am, they're just things that I have noticed within me that have resulted in the way that I was raised and the way that our family worked, were, uh, the way that our family was and the way that I was raised, whether it's good or bad. And so I say this because many of you know my family, and so I don't want you to be judging my parents either, so, uh, or my siblings for that matter. But I guess if you judge them, <laughs> so be it. When I, was in, when I was in other parishes, I could do this, and I wouldn't have to give that preface because nobody knew my family, but it's a little different out here. So, As a family, we actually ate every meal together, especially when I was a little kid. When we were before school and my siblings were getting ready for school, waiting for the bus, we sat down at the table and we, we, ate, we even ate breakfast together. It's pretty, pretty amazing. I remember a dad sitting at the end of the table, siblings trying to find their books, their book bags, and we all sit down, and whatever it was, mom always cooked it. We never had cereal when we were, when we were little kids, it, even if it was a meal as simple as oatmeal or cream of wheat, cream of wheat, yeah, cream of wheat having the lumps in it, if you remember, if you remember that or know what I mean. But that's, that's what we did. On game days when we got older, mom would usually cook us a little bit bigger meal, uh, pancakes or eggs and bacon, something like that. And as I look back, it's pretty, pretty amazing uh, what my mom did. And at one point, there was probably, I think at one point, there were six of us at home, and she would still do this. And uh, when I was real little, there was five of us, and, and with five of us running around and being awake, she would still cook the meals for us and did this. Still do it. Mom and dad still sit down and eat their meals together. But one thing that mom didn't do is she never added salt to anything. I don't know why. It's just one of the things that she just didn't do. Maybe a little bit to the vegetables that we had. But even when we baked and the recipe called for salt, we never added it. So when I became a pastor... I began subscribing to one of these box meals where they send you everything in it and you, you make it, which was perfect for me as a priest because then there is very, never any waste. Um, everything that came was packaged just enough for that meal. I, I actually loved it. But it gives you the recipe and you follow the recipe. And I would follow the recipe. It sent you the salt, you put the salt in it, which I had never done in my entire life. Did I ever put salt in my food, really? Because mom had never done it, right? We do those things that our parents do, the way that we are taught and we are raised. And I realized when I started doing this, everything began to taste different. It wasn't salty. It was actually just very flavorful and good. It was like the taste buds just kind of came alive. And I realized that this was something missing in the food that mom cooked. Good or bad, that's just the way that, it's just the way that she did it. So, curious, I actually Googled whether or not salt can actually make that much of a difference, and it does. We know that salt, it doesn't make food salty, but it actually brings out the flavors in the food and the flavors in the other seasonings, enhancing the food that is already very good, but just enhances it and makes it more flavorful in our mouth. And so, in many ways, salt is necessary for food. So when Jesus speaks of being salt of the earth, in some ways, he's using this example in the very same way. He intends for us as Christians, as Catholics, to be the salt of the earth, meaning that Christianity, Catholicism, makes the world better. It doesn't make the world worse. It makes it better because it creates sanctification. In fact, if we were to go back to the book of Leviticus many of the offerings and the sacrifices that the Israelites were meant to offer to God were were to have salt on them. And so when we look at this salt of the earth that we are meant to be, the sacrifices that we make in our daily life are actually the salt of the earth, offering up and sanctifying this world in which we live. It doesn't take away from our human experience, 
but it enhances it. Enhances this very life that God has given us. So if we are the salt of the earth that Jesus calls us to be, and we don't live out our Christian faith, our Catholic faith, what does that mean for us in the next phrase that Jesus says about those who are not the salt of the earth? Or what does it mean about the, what happens to salt if it loses its flavoring? It says it's no good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So I think what Jesus is calling us to, and remember we're still in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're in the Sermon on the Mount for a few weeks here, is that Jesus is calling us to live out the very things that he is teaching. So the gospel passage we have today immediately follows the Beatitudes that we heard last week. And so living out the Beatitudes actually creates the saltiness of the world that we are meant to be. We are meant to be the salt by living out the very teachings of the Beatitudes that Jesus has just presented in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm currently reading and praying through a book called Be Transformed, The Healing Power of the Sacraments by Dr. Bob Schutz. He's He's a Catholic psychologist who had a major conversion and is, 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 works to interweave uh, true traditional Catholic teaching with psychology. So I've, I'm only on like chapter three, so I've really just begun. But in the second chapter, he speaks about the difference between blessings and curses. He says that when we hear the word blessings, and I think this is true, We kind of go to sleep. We don't really think about what that is actually saying. It's, in a sense, very bland. But the Catechism says this about blessing. In the very first paragraph it says, God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. So blessing is who God is. In Catechism 1079, it says, From the beginning until the end of time, the whole of God's work is a blessing. And in 1078, Blessing is a divine and life-giving action, the source of which is the Father. His blessing is both word and gift. So in these three passages, these three paragraphs from the Catechism, we see first off that blessing originates in the Father, and the Father is eternal blessedness. Secondly, Blessing is the work of God where he communicates his life to us. And thirdly, blessing is actively communicated through both word and gift. And so what Dr. Schutz says is that among all the words the Father speaks to bless us, Jesus is the fullest expression of his word and therefore the greatest possible blessing. Because we hear in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word that has become flesh. He is the most perfect blessing. Likewise, of his many gracious gifts, the Holy Spirit is by far the greatest gift in which all other gifts find their meaning. We can can see reference to that in Acts chapter 238. So the sacraments are gifts of God via the Holy Spirit in which Jesus blesses us through the ministry of the priest, no matter if the priest is holy or sinful. But in receiving the sacraments, we become united to Jesus. Remember in Catechism 460, it says, the reason the word became flesh was to unite us to Christ. God's blessing affirms us in the truth of who we are and enables us through the Holy Spirit to live authentically with ever greater confidence in God's purposes. Every sacrament is a powerful proclamation of the word of benediction upon us, confirming our true identity and mission in Christ. Each sacrament is is that union that we are called to have with Christ. And so as we, in a sense, become another Christ through the sacraments, we are the blessing of God as well. As Jesus is the blessing, the most perfect blessing. Curses are the antithesis of blessing. They bring death and difficulty in place of life and goodness. 
Curses are, are, curses are deceptive and destructive words and actions that tear us down, weaken our resolve and belittle us. They originate in the father of lies, but often come from the sins of others, who themselves have been infected by similar wounds and curses. We can see where the father of lies interweaves his, his curses in the midst of the sin of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. He puts in their heart seeds of doubt of the goodness of God. When what God says is, you are my beloved, you are in my image and likeness, and you are one with me. These sinful words and actions can leave devastating and lasting effects upon our identity while infesting our souls with debilitating lies of the evil one. Sowing into our souls and bodies seeds of discord and discouragement over time, the evil one's curses can cause disease and eventually death. So when received into our spirit, these destructive words and actions have the power to form our identity and falsehood. We know that through the sacrament of baptism, the truth of that sacrament tells us you are loved. God says you are mine. And just like it, at Jesus' baptism, God comes down and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In a similar way, God does the same with us at our baptism. You are my beloved child. With you I am well pleased. But the evil spirit sows the lies within us that says that you are not loved. No one will ever love you. You are not good. We end up believing these lies about, our, about ourselves, God and, and each other. And remember that God created us in the fourfold harmony, in harmony with God, harmony within ourselves, and harmony with each other, and harmony with all of creation. The lies destroy this harmony. Unlike blessings which confirm our identity, give us life and health, the curses only serve to reinforce our false selves, stealing from us the joy and fulfillment that Jesus has promised us. Dr. Schutz says this became even more evident when he picked up a book at a, at a friend's house. The book, the book that he found at his friend's, friend's house was called The Hidden Message in Water by a Japanese scientist, Masaru Emoto. And the book is actually a New York Times bestseller. And I'm going to quote a large chunk from this book because the way that he says it would be much better than the way that I could say it. So Dr. Emoto conducted his research to find out if words and thoughts have power in themselves to define reality. Speaking words of blessing and cursing into containers of water, he then froze the containers of water and then photographed them. It's kind of a strange experiment. Sounds strange. Yet Dr. Mo Dr. Moto had a purpose. He wanted to find out how spoken words could impact even the molecular structure in the water. And it could give insight into the effects and thoughts that words have on our health and well-being. Since our bodies are made up of 70% water and our brains 80% water. So using a microscope, Emoto examined the molecular formation in the frozen water and then photographed them. The results were breathtaking and exactly what the Word of God tells us. Words spoken with conviction really do have a tremendous impact to bless and to curse. Words like happy, good, and love spoken to the one container of water produce beautiful and complex images full of light in this frozen water. Words like depressed, bad, and hate resulted in dark, dense, and ugly images when the molecular structures were closely examined. After conducting a similar study with cooked rice, Emoto found the blessed rice remained white after 30 days of receiving the words, I love you, whereas the cursed rice became black and then decayed after 30 days of repeating the phrase, you fool. Emoto also tested the power of prayer, and the results were equally amazing. Prayer is a primary means of calling upon God's blessing and has an even greater power to shape and define our reality. We know that in the spiritual life there is no neutral ground. We know that we are either progressing towards God or falling away from God. And what we see in this 
molecular structure of this water, seeing the color of the rice. We know that bodily, in many ways, we are even affected by words and actions. We know that it affects the soul. We know that it can tear the soul down or build the soul up. Now, I do have to say, when I did some research on the scientist, other scientists called it pseudoscience and kind of blasted him for kind of being a fool to even do research like this. And so, whether or not it's true, I don't know. But it's amazing what he found anyway. I think it can also go to say that what we listen to, whether it be on TV, whether it be in music, whether it be from other people, has a deep effect on us as well. And so it's necessary for us to really limit the kind of music that we listen to or the kind of TV that we watch or even the kind of speech that we hear from other people. So I was raised in a household in which praise and affirmation wasn't uttered very often. It was understood that everything was fine and you were good as long as you were not being corrected. As someone told me after the homily last night, they said in their household it was, everything is fine unless dad told you to go get a stick. I mean, this was never, it was never stated this way in our family. It wasn't stated this way. This is kind of how I've experienced it. And as I've kind of, uh, kind of gone into the depths of my heart, this is kind of what I've experienced and what I've seen. Like I said, this isn't judgment on my, on my family by any, by any means. It's just what I experience. So to this day, when I hear affirmation or praise, I tend to brush it off and have a hard time believing it to be true. Or under my breath will say things like, but if you only really knew who I was, if you only really knew what I say in confession, if you really only knew my sins, But if I hear one complaint, one criticism, it will stick with me for weeks, maybe even months. And I'll worry about it and stress about it. Some of you maybe have these experiences as well, well, or different ones, that have not necessarily been salt in your life, but are actually wounds that affect you. The beautiful thing is, is that each of the sacraments is meant to be an opportunity in which we experience And hear and know that we are loved by God. And he loves us as we are. Our wounds, our dirt, and everything. We may have sin that needs to be confessed and worked out, but that's the point of confession. And confession is that place where we personally hear the words of God spoken through the priest to say, you are forgiven. The priest says, I forgive you. I absolve you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But the priest is speaking in the person of Christ. The priest is Christ in that sacrament. And so it's God saying, I absolve you. We need to hear that. It's good for our soul. It's good for our bodies. We need to know that our sins are forgiven and that God loves us. Our identity is to be a child of God. We hear it from the moment of our baptism. We are his blessing because we are in Christ Jesus. He calls us his sons and daughters, as his sons and daughters, to be blessings to others. To be the salt and the light in their lives. If Dr. Moda's study is legit, we literally can change people by speaking blessing into their life. Being the salt of the earth means that we are meant to change the world by how we speak, by how we act, by how we live our life. The gospel today goes on to say about the, he says, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket to set on a lampstand. And Jesus says, just so your light must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly father. The good deeds are necessary for us to be witnesses to others in this world. To be witnesses of God's goodness and his blessing in our lives. It's even necessary for us to think about how we speak to our children. What are we saying to them? How many times are we affirming them in a day? How many times are we 
correcting them. And correction is good, it is necessary. I'm not saying don't ever correct your children. But what I'm saying is that are we only correcting them? We need to be affirming more than we correct. Or in the way that we correct, we also need to affirm. That's true love. To build one another up, to build them up in the kingdom of God. Because of what I've experienced growing up, I find myself doing the very same things that my parents did. That's how we are. We are imitators by nature. And so it's a huge challenge for me to overcome that, to be able to see someone and be able to affirm them for what they are doing. Because in my mind, it's as long as everything's fine, I'll tell you if it isn't. God's grace works miracles in our lives if we let it. If we build up walls and we don't let that grace to work, that grace can't work. God's not going to kick down the door of our hearts. He's a gentleman. He will knock. And we can either leave that door shut or we can open it to allow that transformation to happen within us. If we allow that transformation to happen within us, that blessedness rules our lives. And that blessedness is then extended to those that we encounter in our life. And we become that child of God that we are intended to be. To not just receive the blessing, but to give it as God so desires that we do.